Module 3 will cover safety data sheets and responsibilities. Safety data sheets, or an SDS, are a summary of documents that provide information about the hazards of a product and advice about safety precautions. An SDS was formally called Material Safety Data Sheets, or an MSDS. SDSs must be in both English and French. This information may appear either on a single bilingual SDS or two separate unilingual documents that constitute one bilingual SDS. Safety data sheets must be updated to include significant new information. This is information which changes the classification of a hazardous product or ways to protect against the hazards presented by the product. This must be updated within 90 days of becoming available. In the interim 90-day period upon sale of the hazardous product, that information must be communicated in writing to any purchaser of the product. The safety data sheets consist of 16 sections, and these are now standardized so that the sections are always the same and in the same order. They are identification, hazards identification, composition, first aid measures, firefighting measures, accidental release measure, handling and storage, exposure control or PPE, physical and chemical properties, stability and reactivity, toxicological information, ecological information, disposal considerations, transport information, regulatory information, and other information. Section 1. Identification provides information on the type of substance or mixture, as well as the name of the supplier, recommended uses, and the contact detail information of the supplier, including an emergency contact. Requirements consist of product identifier, other means of identification, recommended use and restrictions on use, initial supplier identifier, and an emergency telephone number and any restrictions on the use of that number, if applicable. Section 2, Hazard Identification. This is the most important section which provides a summary of all hazards associated with the chemical. Special pictograms are used in this section to broadly identify typical hazards. All broad hazards are divided into specific categories, which are further ranked according to their severity by number, with Category 1 chemicals considered the most dangerous. Requirements consist of classification of the hazardous product, for example, carcinogenicity would be Category 1, the symbol, signal word, hazard statement, and precautionary statement for each of the applicable classes. If the required information element is a symbol, either the name of the symbol or the symbol itself may be used and other hazards known to the supplier with respect to the hazardous product. Section 3. Composition or Information on Ingredient Substance This provides information on the ingredients of the product. This includes identifying impurities and stabilizing additives which are themselves classified and which contribute to the classification of the substance. This section may also be used to provide information on complex substances. When applicable, the exclusion of confidential information must be clearly stated here as well. Requirements consist of chemical identity, common name, synonyms, etc., CAS number and other unique identifiers, impurities and stabilizing additives which are themselves classified and which contribute to the classification of a substance. Section 4, First Aid Measures. This provides information on the initial care that can be given by an untrained responder without the use of sophisticated equipment or wide selection of medications. If medical attention is required, it should be stated, including its urgency. It may be useful to provide information on the immediate effects by route of exposure and indicate the immediate treatment followed by possible delayed effects with specific medical surveillance required. The requirements consist of description of necessary measures subdivided according to the different routes of exposure, for example, inhalation, skin and eye contact, and ingestion, the most important symptoms and effects, acute or delayed, 
an indication of immediate medical attention and special treatment needed if necessary. Section 5, Firefighting Measures. This provides the requirements for fighting a fire caused by the substance or mixture or arising in its vicinity. The requirements consist of suitable and unsuitable extinguishing media, specific hazards arising from the chemical, for example, nature of any hazardous combustion products, and special protective equipment and precautions for firefighters. Section 6. Accidental release measures provide the appropriate response to spills, leaks, or releases in order to prevent or minimize the adverse effects on persons, property, and the environment. They distinguish between responses for large and small spills and where the spill volume has a significant impact on the hazard. The procedures for containment and recovery may indicate that different practices are required. The requirements consist of personal precautions, protective equipment and emergency procedures, methods and materials for containment and cleaning up, and understanding how a product needs to be cleaned up and how to dispose of it is very important. Because it is something we might not often do, we may not be as familiar with the requirements. This is why it is good to know where to locate the safety data sheet so that this information can be found, ensuring that proper cleanup and disposal will happen. Section 7. Handling and Storage provides guidance on safe handling practices that minimize the potential hazards to people, property, and the environment from the substance or mixture, and emphasize precautions to the intended use and to the unique properties of the substance or mixture. Requirements consist of precautions for safe handling and conditions for safe storage, including incompatible materials. Section 8. Exposure controls and personal protection provides occupational exposure limits and exposure control measures. This includes engineering control measures that are needed to minimize exposure and risks associated with the hazard of the substance or mixture. Protection requirements consist of control parameters including occupational exposure limit values or biological limit values and the source of those values, and appropriate engineering controls. Section 9. Physical and chemical properties provides the empirical data of the substance or mixture, if possible. In the case of a mixture, the entry should clearly indicate to which ingredient the data applies to, unless it is valid for the whole mixture. The data included in the subsection should apply to the substance or mixture. Clearly identify the following properties and specify appropriate units of measure and or reference conditions where appropriate. If relevant for the interpretation of the numeric value, the method of determination should also be provided, for example, for flashpoint and open closed cup. Requirements consist of any chemical and physical properties which you can see listed here. All of this data helps to inform what is needed for handling, storage, and what personal protective equipment is required. Section 10. Stability and reactivity describes the reactivity hazards of the substance or mixture and provides specific test data for the substance or mixture as a whole where available. However, the information may also be based on general data for the class or family of chemicals if such data adequately represents the anticipated hazard of the substance or mixture. Chemical stability describes any stabilizers which may be needed to or used to maintain the product you must indicate the safety significance of any change in the physical appearance of the product. Requirements consist of reactivity, chemical stability, possibility of hazardous reactions, conditions to avoid including static discharge or shock or vibration, incompatible materials, and hazardous decomposition products. Section 11. Toxicological information. This section is used primarily by medical professionals, occupational health and safety professionals, and toxicologists. A complete and comprehensible description of the various health effects and the available data used to identify those effects should be provided. Under GHS classification, the relevant hazards for which data should be provided are information on the likely routes of exposure via inhalation, ingestion, skin and eye contact, 
symptoms related to the physical, chemical, and toxicological characteristics, delayed and immediate effects and chronic effects from short-term and long-term exposure, and numerical measures of toxicity, including acute toxicity estimates. Section 12, Ecological Information. While the heading of this section is required to preserve the SDS 16 heading format, content within this section is optional. The content consists of ecotoxicity, both aquatic and terrestrial if applicable, persistence and degradability, bioaccumulative potential, mobility in soil, and other adverse effects. Ecotoxicity refers to the potential for biological, chemical, or physical stressors to affect ecosystems, and bioaccumulation refers to the accumulation of substances such as pesticides or other organic chemicals in an organism. Bioaccumulation occurs when an organism absorbs a toxic substance at a rate greater than that at which the substance is lost. Section 13, Disposal Considerations. This content consists of information on safe handling for disposal and methods of disposal, including any contaminated packaging. Section 14, Transport Information. The requirements consist of a UN number, transport hazard class and packing group as provided in the UN model regulations, environmental hazards according to the UN and International Maritime Dangerous Goods Code, and transport in bulk. Section 15, Regulatory Information. The requirements consist of safety, health, and environmental regulations made within or outside Canada specific to the product in question. Section 16 is other information. The requirements consist of the date of the latest revision of the safety data sheet. Safety data sheets must be updated within 90 days after there is any significant new information that changes the class of the hazardous product. This is based on the United Nations globally harmonized system. It is important to do your best to go back and review your safety data sheets and update if needed. You can generally get this information online or have the manufacturing company send you the updated version. We're going to discuss how everyone is responsible for WMS and what the responsibilities are. Employer Responsibilities Employers need to know exactly what hazardous products are present and how they are used, handled, or stored in the workplace. There should be a way to maintain these records on such things like the location and amount. The organization also needs to ensure requirements for labels and safety data sheets are met and that workers have access to them. Understanding who may be exposed to the hazardous products will help to determine which of your staff needs education and training. Employers must ensure that up-to-date safety data sheets and labels are present so that workers can be informed about significant new data. Employers need to develop procedures for safe use, handling, storage and disposal of a hazardous product, understanding the impact when the product is in a pipe, piping system, vessel or tank car, etc., how to protect workers who may be exposed, and what must be done in an emergency involving the hazardous product. We are now going to focus on the employee responsibilities. There are three main points that are required for employees and they are all important and connected. Number one is participation in the WMIS education and training, which includes both this online training and training you'll need on any products that you may come into contact with at your workplace. Number two is follow instructions and safe work procedures. We cannot stress enough how important this is. And number three, be familiar with all hazardous products you are handling or may be exposed to. Other things to keep in mind. Ensure that labels are in good condition and do not use products without labels. Make sure you know how to access the safety data sheets and understand the information on the safety data sheets. Be sure to ask for help if you have any questions about any product you are working with, and be sure to report any concerns. This completes Module 3 and brings us to the end of the WMIS training. Please click below to complete the Module 3 quiz. Once you have successfully completed all three quizzes, you will receive your certificate for WMIS 2015.